Real, so you did not finish the I thesis? I did not finish the thesis. They took my money away for getting married in those days in Great Britain. Really? Yep. So a married woman didn't get a grant. So had you had they not, would you have finished the thesis? I don't think so. You I were ready to do something. I needed else. to be a novelist. I, I was in a terrible state okay. of mind. I was sitting in the library trying to work on the thesis and secretly writing the novel. And it was, as you say, it was it was a slightly mad time. Uh -huh. Well, I want to talk about possession because our audience will want to hear about it. We will talk about your new novel as well, but um, Possession, which I have to say was a very uh, important novel for me when it came out. Uh, I was out of graduate school at that time, but uh, my field was 19th century British literature, and that novel is such an extraordinary foray into 19th century literature with a contemporary plot, and I like to say to people that that novel did for literary scholarship what the television show CSI did, has done for criminal forensic <laughs> medicine. It made it sexy. And um, you have characters in the present who are researching characters in the 19th century, and you keep these two plot lines going. It, it, it's extraordinary. Tell us about how you came up with that and how you juggled those two plots. Um, I came. I came up with the word, really. Possession. I see, began with the word possession. And the poet who was doing the possessing was not Browning at that stage, but Coleridge. And I was watching the great Coleridge scholar Kathleen Coburn going round and round the British Library, round catalogue. And I thought, this wonderful woman has spent the whole of her life on somebody else's thoughts, you know. And then I thought, does he possess her? <laughs> or does she possess him? <laughs> then I thought you could write a sort of ghost story called Possession. Yeah. And then I didn't write it for a long time because I was busy. And then I thought, oh, no, there was an economic sense too because she actually gathered up Coleridge's notebooks and secreted them away to Canada and emailed everybody from the, well, no, not emailed, um, telegraphed everybody yeah. from the middle of the Atlantic uh -huh. saying the notebooks are quite safe, they're going to Toronto. So that was economic possession. And then I only thought of the sexual term possession quite later on. And I thought you could have two poets like the Brownings who loved each other and wrote these. I think they're the best love letters that exist. And that would be possession. Then I thought if you have two poets, you have two detectives and you have modern scholars. Uh -huh. And modern scholars do so much theorizing about sex that they're scared of it yeah. and timid of it. Yeah, what a, it was a wonderful conceit, and especially at the time you were writing it, when theory was in such high gear. Yes. And you critique that, but you also have a certain sympathy, it seems oh, I, I enjoy yeah. reading, you know, I enjoy yeah. reading theory. I just, I get distressed by people using it. I was, I was talking um, in Cheltenham last week, and there was a row of students in the front row who were working on possession. And one <laughs> after another, they said, please tell us your views about gender. <laughs> and I was so depressed, not because I don't have views, but because I could see they'd got me in a kind of pigeonhole. They weren't reading the book for fun at all. Yeah. And I wanted to say, you know, please go away and enjoy the story. It's sort of what's going on, what you're critiquing in the novel, it's true. Well, I, I, w I want to get to the children's book, because we have limited time, and I want to make sure that we talk about this book, which is set in the Edwardian period, and which is such a, uh, an aesthetically rich canvas. Um, you have the, I suppose, the main character if, uh, is Olive Wellwood, a children's book writer, and her many children living in this wonderful arts and crafts sort of house. And I wonder about your choice of this period, this movement. Uh, did you decide, I'm going to write about this particular aesthetic movement in this period, or how did it come to you? Um, I think most of my novels come with a small thing and spread, mm. because I, I can't stop finding out. Um, this one came with my realization that the children of children's book writers tend to be very unhappy. <laughs> you know, you have this image of the wonderful children's book writer like Mother Goose yeah. by the fire telling stories to her children and how privileged these children are. And actually they seem to wander around rather lost in the dark and th frequently commit suicide. It oh. seems to be very unsettling. I didn't get to the bottom of it, but I knew there was <laughs> a really good plot in there. And so then I 
started with E. Nesbitt. Olive is not E. Nesbitt, who is a middle-class woman. But E. Nesbitt was a founding member of the Fabian Society uh -huh. and used to sit there clicking her fan in the meetings. And I thought, you know, what connects children's writing to high-minded Fabianism? So I started researching on a broad front. And the arts and crafts came in at that moment because arts and crafts is the kind of garden in which it all grew up, both the children's books and the serious socialism and Fabianism. Mm. And um, I think I enjoyed it the most of my books because it has absolutely nothing to do with me personally. Mm. I just was finding things out. And I am most myself and happiest when I'm finding things out. It, I can see. I mean, it's full of knowledge. It's full of revelatory information. But it's also, it's a social critique of a, of a vast sort in the sense that you seem to be implied. It ends with World War I, the catastrophe of World War I, as though the notion of children and the children's books, writers, children, are somehow emblematic of... Um, a certain kind of innocence or a certain sort of arrested development that was then led to World War I, I suppose. I mean, is that, what kind of social statement, historical, cultural statement are you making? Um, well, you have put very well, you know, what I, what I was, what I, I discovered rather than knew. Um, I read a lot of German writing about that war too. And all these boys waving their flags, having come out of these German military schools, marching, I mean, there's a sort of description by Stefan Zweig of all the young men singing and marching through the streets and how Vienna changed overnight, you know, from an immensely civilized, rather ancient city to a capital full of young men waving flags. Mm. And the same thing happened in Britain. You know, they were all eager for a sudden glory, um, as Wilfred Owen said, children eager for a sudden glory. Right, you tell right. them the old lie, dulce et decorum es pro patria mori. Um, and I was very moved, really, because I hadn't gone into the First World War. And I read an enormous amount of biographies of people who had survived or who didn't, after all, survive. And, um, and the really most awful thing about it was, it seems to me to have been just a muddle. There seemed to have been no really good economic or political reasons why it happened. It seemed to me, after all the work I did, that it was just because the Kaiser was mad. Mm. He wanted to annoy his imperial family. Yeah. It made me very much more socialist even than <laughs> I already was. <laughs> Well, the, the book has so much going on in it. I mean, really, it, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. But the, the, the artistic element, uh, the pottery, um, I wonder about you and pottery. <laughs> <laughs> you know so much about glazes, if, if only that. I mean, did you become a potter in this, in writing this book? Or did um, you? No, I'm descended from potters. Uh -huh. I'm descended from people from... Oh, uh, Frederica Potter. I just made that connection. Excuse exactly. Me. Yeah. Um, it's a, yeah. I hadn't remembered it either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I am descended from Potters from the Five Towns, mm. although people have written to me several times and said it's actually the Six Towns. It was just Arnold Bennett who called them the Five Towns. I'm descended from working class Potters who worked in the factories. And I've come to the conclusion I can't write a book without having a hero or heroine who makes some kind of object. Mm. It's, I think that's what I most love about human beings, that they make useful or beautiful objects. And that would include very complicated mechanical devices as well as pots and glass. Um, we don't have that much time. I have so many questions to ask you, so I'm going to move along and ask you about, and we've been talking about creativity and its many manifestations. You're from a very creative family. Your sister is the writer Margaret Drabble, and your other sister, your third sister, is second sister, is um, Helen Langdon, the art historian. And I wonder if you have thoughts about how a family divvies up creativity. Um, I, I think we're not a very usual family in the sense that we don't talk to each other very much. Uh -huh. I, I, my, own, my own feeling about it is that I try to salvage 
my life of the mind from my family's life of the mind. I, I'm a natural solitary. Mm. And I don't, I mean, I talk to my art historical sister a bit about art history because it's more distant. I don't think I've ever once talked to my writing sister about writing. Do you think there's a natural rivalry that happens between writers and especially if they're sisters? I think there probably is. And I think also there's a sort of fear. Um, I don't wish to be remembered as part of a family identity. I wish to be remembered for the books I've written. It's nothing to do with me. Um, I mean, and you feel that way about feminism too, from what I yes, can Yes, I'm not a group animal. I'm a, I'm a solitary animal. Um, all the things I've done that really matter to me, um, apart from my husband and my children, um, have been done when I was on my own. And um, there are artistic families where everybody works together, but my feeling about the Brontes when I discovered that they sat and endlessly wrote books together was, how on earth could they? How could anybody do something with somebody else? You do it in order to get away from other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. and, and that's very much how I grew up. Interesting. Well, you know, we're out of time. I have about 10 more things I want to ask you, but they'll have to wait for another interview. I want to thank you so much, Antonia Byatt, A.S. Byatt, for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us at the Drexel interview.